Okay, it was one of the main purposes of the Agenda project to investigate uh, public sector transfers in the light of demographic change. And an important question in this regard is, uh, can the uh, public transfers remain in a similar form as today or will there be major changes? So the question of sustainability. So we made a brainstorming if we can get such a measure based on this age-specific public transfer data we measured in NDA. This was together with Alexia, Robert, uh, Lily and Tanya and we came to a solution. We called our baby the human capital investment gap in, in about three slides, it will be clear why we chose this name. And we think that such a measure is important. And you listen to, politician, listen to politicians, they always say, well, pension system is safe and everything will, can be maintained, no problem. But, for, for example, how a pay-as-you-go pension system is designed, it's, it's pretty clear that there have to be adjustment to a change in population structure. And it's sometimes scientists have to say, uh, it's really important to tell the people also, well, there have to be adjustments in the public transfer system because uh, the design of the systems affect important economic decisions of the people and to make good decisions regarding old age provision you also have to be able to predict how public transfers will, be, will change with uh, population aging. So the main idea of uh, this human capital investment gap is to capture the reciprocal nature of intergenerational transfers. This is sometimes described as generational contract. The parental generation uses resources for their children, so they invest in children, as in form of time, in terms of goods and services they provide, and the child generation provides uh, care and pay share of their income to the elderly parental generation when they are then in working age. So we can interpret this as the return to these investments in children. So the crucial question for each cohort or each generation is if this investment in children have been large enough to finance the transfer to the parental generation at the desired level. And I agree very much with Robert that we tend to uh, forget or we, it's not so visible these transfers to the children. And, uh, when Ron, for example, says, okay, the costs of, of uh, population aging could, should be shared between generations, it, it, he probably doesn't take into account that population aging is at least part of a consequence that some generations provide less resources to their children than others. Or for example, we heard yesterday a presentation by Markus Knell speaking about the sustainability and the fairness of the public pension system, but he ignored completely transfers to the children. Although it is these transfers which determine uh, the ability of the child generation to pay future contributions. What we see here is uh, this above, uh, so transfer, uh, intergenerational transfers by age, uh, private transfers and public transfers. Here it's measured in terms of labor income of a full-time worker. This is the measure I will use uh, throughout the paper. So the, uh, the working age population transfers resources to children in form of public transfers and private transfers uh, and to the elderly and the transfers to the elderly are mainly, in, or the net transfers are mainly in form of public transfers. So working age population, they have to invest in resources to children and let's say a generation later, the children are in working age and they provide part of their income they generate to the elderly uh, population. So the question is, are so these investments that mind to a large degree how much the child generation is able to pay when they are in working age to the elderly generation? Uh, so what we do is we calculate uh, this uh, human capital, capital investment gap for a certain cohort. We use the cohort born in 1950. These are those guys who are about retirement at the age of 60 in 2010, when we have, uh, where we have the data from. And we calculate the difference between net public <coughs> benefits in old age that can be expected by a member of the cohort born in 1950, and the no total net public contributions to the elderly that is paid by the child generation over their working life. 
Uh, as data source, we use the national uh, trans, also the Agenda National Transfer Accounts data for public transfers. Uh, we also need data on modality. This is taken from the Europop 2013 uh, projection and data on completed cohort fertility, where we use data from the Human Fertility Database. So, two parts. The expected public old page benefits for the members of the cohort born in 1950 and the expected public contribution of the children's generation per member of the 1950 cohort. So, first part is the public uh, transfer benefits that can be expected by a member of the cohort born in 1950 and this is pretty straightforward. What you see here is the net public transfers uh, for uh, three countries, the black line is the European average over 25 countries, and uh, Austria, Fra uh, France, and Germany. You see, for example, that in Austria, that they, we pay more public transfers relative to the income of the full time worker during working age, but the system is also more generate in, in old age. So, what we are doing is we take this. Uh, age specific values of per capita net transfers in old age, adjusted with um, survival probability and estimate how much transfers people can expect over, uh, uh, over their old age. Uh, we take into account that, uh, uh, that the year or the age when people become net transfer receiver various across countries. And yeah this is the uh, we just sum up over all ages the uh, but, uh, public net transfers that can be expected at old age adjusted with survival productivity. So what we get as results when we do this and sum up our old ages, we see that in Austria and Finland, it, uh, the people or the cohort born in 1950, they can expect public net transfers worth about 10 times the labor income of a full-time worker. There are huge large difference of across countries and Germany it's for example. Uh, much less. The, uh, the public sector is less generous to the elderly, so to say. And we also can compose with the expected number of years with positive uh, net benefits various across countries. It's a bit lower in Sweden than in other countries uh, because uh, of, of later uh, retirement age. And we see huge differences in the average net benefits. Uh, in Austria and Finland, for example, the, pub the public net transfers are to some degree more generous than in other countries, making up 40% of, uh, of the income of the food and work. So, now this is a bit more tricky, the net public contributions paid by their, ch uh, <coughs> their children would be able to pay over the working age. We would take into account that the employment rates are likely to, in, to increase, so people stay more healthy, they live longer, but they're better educated and we think they're more likely to stay longer in working age. So we want to take into account that this child generation works uh, longer years uh, uh, than their parents. So uh, we need several assumptions that the size of the child generation is covered. Basically, of course, a big role is calculated that they don't complete the cohort fertility. And we also said, uh, not all public transfers paid during working age go to the elderly. Some are used for the children in terms of education. And we use just the value we observe in 2010. So how much of the uh, public net transfers are used for the elderly generation and how much for the children. Now it comes a little bit the tricky part because we want to take into account the increasing employment rates. So we distinguish this public uh, contributions and the benefits are, are, are according if they are associated with employment, directly associated with employment or not. So the public uh, contributions and benefits to the public sector that are not directly related to employment, such as consumption taxes or uh, taxes on asset income remain constant at the age, also age specific constant at the 2010 level relative to the income of a full time worker. And the contributions and benefits directly related to employment, such as, of course, wage taxes, pensions, uh, 
We assume that they stay relative to the income of, the, of a full-time worker, observed in the 2010 data, conditional unemployment status. So thereby we take into account that when people stay long in working life, they make higher contribution in form of wage taxes, for example, and get less in form of pensions. So now, if you didn't understand what I said in the last slide, I, here you have the results. We just simulate public con age specific public contributions and benefits. So the benefits are the blue line, the well, contributions are the black line, and what we are interested is this area in between. So these are the transfers uh, paid to the child generation or the elderly generation. And if we calculate the share, that is well, not the share, the total amount uh, that is paid to the elderly generation, we get the following res results. So in Italy, uh, Sweden and Austria, the contributions of the child generation over their whole working life in terms of labor income of a full-time worker also is about six. So over their working life, they pay six, also six labor incomes of the full-time worker to the elderly generation, so to say. And we also can compose uh, these transfers and, and get important characteristics of pension system. So we can get, for example, expected number of years with positive net contributions, which is in all countries about 40. Uh, we observe huge differences in the average uh, contribution relative to the income of a full time worker. So in Austria, uh, Italy and Sweden it's about uh, one quarter, and Spain is much less because they simply have lower taxes on labor income and uh, what also plays a role is the high unemployment rate. <coughs> Uh, interest also the share paid to the elderly in, in terms of total public contributions in all countries between 60 and 70 percent. And you, of course, also the number of children plays a considerable role. But also here, huge differences are observed in the level of public contributions and benefits relative to the income of a full time work, and this makes up the most important differences across countries. And here I uh, presented uh, the, the results in form of a graph for all the countries. So the height of this bars uh, is uh, the expected net benefits of the elderly generation. So this is, uh, for example, around 10 in Austria and Finland. And the, 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 the yellow bar, uh, bar is the bar that can be covered through the contributions of the child generation. And the blue bar is the, the bar which is remaining. And we see that in all countries, more or less, so if, according to the, if we assume this staying constant, uh, according to this uh, 2010 patterns, we see that in all countries, there remains a gap. It is very small in Bulgaria, because there is a small involvement of the public sector in old age uh, contributions, or in Italy, because Italy already uh, has high contributions, high taxes on labor income, and uh, redistributes a large share of these contributions to the elderly generations. And we see this high bar in, in Greece. So we have 2010 uh, data. This would look very different today. But it also speaks for such indicators that obviously can identify uh, imbalances in the transfer system which are not sustainable. So now we ask what would happen if the uh, employment rates in old age would increase even more and here we assume retirement at the age of 70 and what we see here is that there is still uh, a part of this gap remaining. So even when the children would work, and, uh, the, this, uh, the children of the 1950 cohort would work until 70, they would still be not able to cover fully uh, the net benefits that their parents expect, so to say. The reason is uh, that it's considered so the cross country differences uh, can be explained by the level of the transfers and benefits. And I would say that uh, such adjustments also in the level and the benefits of the uh, transfers are probably inevitable. So when we conclude, Important message is that the intergenerational transfers consist of transfers to the elderly and of transfers to children. Transfers to the elderly are mainly public transfers. The transfers to the children 
mainly private transfers, these transfer components are interrelated. So the transfers to the children, so in terms of their number, their education, determines the children's ability to finance the public transfers to the elderly once they are in working age. And demographic changes, which can also be interpreted as a level, as a change in the level of transfers to the children. So when fertility decreases, uh, parents use mostly less resources for their children. They require changes in the age pattern of public transfers. And what we find is that the level of benefits and contributions will have to change in the future, at least when it's measured relative to the income of the full-time worker. And increasing retirement will probably not be sufficient. And at the end, I also always want to make some advertisement. We would be very, very happy uh, if you use our data. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. so much. Uh, I like um, uh, we have a question from Ron. So let's uh, it's very interesting and it fits in interesting ways with the previous talk before coffee. Um, however, I find that I disagree with the uh, concept of generational contract. Uh, used here, uh, which is essentially an exchange, uh, which I think is very different than uh, transfers. So uh, I note that in hunter-gatherer and subsistence societies, subsistence agricultural societies, all transfers from every age of adult are going to children with no counterflows at all. Uh, so there's no exchange whatsoever in that case. And in Samuelson's model, there are no children. And there are uh, transfers to the elderly that make possible a welfare improving uh, allocation of consumption over the life cycle. So uh, to my mind, the social contract is something like I devote resources to raising my children, and I expect my children to devote resources to raising their children. On the one hand, and on the other hand, I devote resources to supporting the current elderly, and I expect the next generation to devote resources to supporting me. And there's no uh, necessary link between those two. Wearing the hat that I'm wearing at this moment, but I must say before the break, I was very happy with the idea of linking the uh, the investment in, in children to the uh, uh, old age pensions. So I'm a little confused, but that's the <coughs> point. Okay, thank you. I, the idea of this generational contract was it, it's sometimes used in the way you say that you, you provide something to the elderly, also the working age population, and they expect their children can provide it. But the problem is that they fix somehow the level. They see, okay, they pay their parents, their, their parents, let's say, pension 80% of their later income. So they expect from their children also pensions 80% of their labor income, not taking into account that their number of children might be considerably slow, uh, lower. And they would have to provide a much higher share uh, in pensions contributions than the, the current working age population does. So it was more or less to capture really this fundamental relationship that also that your number of children or the investment and in children determines your old age provision. And we found that the con this generational contract is useful in this sense. It's also used sometimes in this sense. It and is, yeah. it has these characteristics uh, we think that the contract should, should have these characteristics of being an exchange. So you provide something, you get something from the uh, respective group, because otherwise it would be, uh, be a contract on the coast of a third party 
and for good reasons are in the legal system such contracts forbidden. <laughs> My problem is with the notion of exchange in this context, not with the basic point, I guess. Uh, yes, thanks. I, I, I think it's an inspiring talk to think about precisely the things you've been just been discussing with Ron and which we've been talking about before as well. Now, I have a I have a different point. I, I mean, you, you tie it in nicely, and I think as a first step, that's, that's probably the way one ought to do it, by kind of looking at a parent generation and a children's generation. But then uh, I was thinking about the talk we had earlier uh, based on the Rangel model, which actually ties in three generations. And, and very often now we, we're talking about the sandwich generation, so they're kind of providing to their parents, they're providing to their children. Could be time, could be money. I mean, it's a bit of both, really. But, but that, that seems uh, not to be captured yet by, by just looking at at parents and children, and, and I wonder if you start actually somehow stretching this concept, because of course it's also, I mean, your pensions are not just being paid by your children, but also by, 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 by other children who may already have different levels of human capital. Of course that's very difficult, difficult to capture, but I just wonder whether you have some ideas of whether that matters or how it could be taken into account. Uh, no, I don't, because as you said, it's very difficult to capture. <laughs> uh, and honestly, we have time only for a short answer. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>